Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, located in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ and a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition. 15 months ago, uh, Zugbi and Tarek and Marcel and Osama, they were on our very first COVID-induced <laughs> interview. <laughs> uh, um, it, what a year it's been. And so we want to catch up with Zugbi and Osama and Tarek. And so we're, uh, we're delighted to be spending some time today with our dearest, dearest friends of 22 years and really a friend to so many around the world. Uh, Zugbi, you and your family and we am have touched literally thousands and thousands of lives, not only in Bethlehem and in uh, the West Bank, but around the world. And uh, we love you. We respect you. Uh, for all that work. Zugby, as many of you know, is the founder and executive director of the WEM Conflict Resolution and Transformation Center in Bethlehem. And also joining him are two of his colleagues who he's known uh, for a few years uh, in their lives, uh, his colleagues at WEM, uh, Osama Zugby and Tarek Al Zugby. And so Tarek uh, and Osama and Zugby. Uh, welcome. It's good to have you on uh, the screen with us today. You are welcome. It's a great honor to be with you. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, as I mentioned to you, we uh, you you have so many friends uh, on the screen uh, on the program here today. Tell us how you and your families are doing uh, are doing during this COVID time uh, uh, as we sit here today uh, at, at the end of May. Um, Tarek, Osama, you start. I, I think COVID hit every home. COVID hit every home. And uh, we thank God that we are in good shape. And, uh, you know, and of course, it was not easy for all of us to take into consideration how to continue doing our services uh, to the people without being affected badly. So it was really uh, a struggle, a struggle of existence, a struggle to be careful. Just a few days ago, we had the vaccine, not all of us. For example, I talk about myself. My wife, who is with me, hasn't the vaccine yet. So uh, there is fear and there is a, you know, unknown future for us regarding COVID and uh, that. But we appreciate the question you have been asking about us. And it's always uplifting to see people who care for us, who live in a sheltered place. And you care for us despite also the pandemic had large in the States. So thank you for this wonderful uh, follow up about our health, about our sanity, and about our relationship. Thank you, Zugbi. And Osama, your family and yourself, uh, tell us about, uh, I'm assuming maybe that you haven't received a vaccine yet. Uh, uh, where are things standing with you and your family? Um, yes, hello everyone, and good morning and good evening from Palestine. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, actually, personally, I uh, did not yet get the vaccine. Uh, you know, like there was an announcement today by the Ministry of uh, Health in Bethlehem that tomorrow, uh, you know, like uh, some vaccines will be available for uh, people who work in the tourism industry and the uh, education industry and the education sector and the uh, 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 medic uh, sent, uh, sector uh, for people who is over uh, 40 years. You know, for me personally, I, I need to wait a little bit uh, before I get the vaccine because I were tested positive 40, day, 40 days ago. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I have recovered, uh, you know, I'm doing okay. You know, like I had some symptoms uh, when I was tested positive and uh, now I'm doing okay. So I need to wait a little bit before I get it. 
Uh, so maybe after two months uh, from now, I will go and get vaccine. Uh, you know, like, uh, so uh, I think around 30% or a little bit more of the Palestinians these days uh, get the vaccine. And uh, thanks God, we have less numbers of uh, new cases. For example, in Bethlehem right now, maybe we have only 50, um, you know, active uh, cases. And uh, in, in uh, um, you know, like, uh, uh, so numbers are... Um, numbers are, are, are dropping um, uh, down in all Palestine. We are, are talking about uh, around 3,700 uh, cases, including East Jerusalem and Gaza Strip and the West Bank. So we have less than 4,000 active cases these days. So the number of the new cases are coming down. And the vaccine is one of the reasons, you know, people are still taking care, um, um, you know, uh, or how to deal in gatherings and all of these. Okay. Uh, Osama, your your wife and kids, uh, did they catch COVID as well? Or how, how are they doing? Uh, yes, my my daughter Layar and my wife uh, also were tested positive after I was tested positive. And uh, my wife get worse symptoms than mine. Uh, she still feel tired and uh, uh, but three of us have recovered and uh, thanks God. Uh, but it wasn't an easy experience for us as a family. Uh, the other two boys didn't, uh, you know, tested uh, positive. So uh, it wasn't an easy experience. Um, so, you know, like as Palestinian, we have been quarantined for many years already. And to be isolated and quarantined again, that's an extra uh, burden. Uh, and uh, with all this political situation that surrounded us, even after we were recovered and we want to just go out for airing or just for a walk outside of Bethlehem, there is a lot of challenges these days because of the political situation and because of, uh, you know, what's, what's going around uh, with the settler violence and the checkpoints and all of these things. You know, you remember uh, uh, last time we were in the desert yeah, we yeah. we we spent time at at the um, at the uh, Bedouin community uh, camp. Uh, just yesterday, I was talking with my friends there, and they say they have a new outpost. Just yesterday, you know, like the settlers started an outpost next door, and in 24 hours, they have electricity, they have water, and they have everything. Uh, and for for the village, you know, they have been suffering many times, and they get the electricity only in 2009, which is some years ago. So that's the situation which is continue. And uh, yeah, so I wanna give more floor for my colleagues to share more of their stories. And, uh. and Tarek, Tarek, you and your family, uh, how's your mother? And uh, tell us, so as your dad said that uh, she is there in Bethlehem with you. Is she still having to leave every three months to go out and come back in? How is that going with your mom? And how are you doing? Oh, well, uh, first of all, I'm doing well. And thank you for having us and for having this platform uh, to speak on some of these issues. Uh, my mother is well, she is currently with us. Um, but as to your other question of whether she will receive a visa extension, it's all up in the air. We were lucky to receive one visa extension um, at the beginning of this year, but we believe we received it because of the pandemic and because of the worsening situation. And there were periods of times where the borders were closed. And so she wouldn't have been able to return even if her visa ran out. Um, now, as things are getting a little bit better in terms of the pandemic, and they're looking at bringing back tourists, especially from Europe and the States and around the world from countries that have vaccines and have vaccinated populations, um, we are afraid that she will no longer have an extension and then she will be forced out of her home again and have to um, go to the States and live with my grandparents or, and such. So uh, is there a time frame that you, I mean, when, whenever things open back up again, is that how it works or do you have a, a time certain for that? We are well, hoping to reapply um, in, next month at the end of June. And then usually it'll take anywhere from two to four weeks. And then as soon as we receive the response, 
you know, if it's a favorable response, she should be able to have an extension for three months or six months. If it's not a favorable response, she'll likely have two to four days to leave the country, pack up and return to the States. I remember the last time I was with you, you know, you, there, was a, there was a world outcry uh, uh, a, a year and a half ago or so. I remember we had Amira Haas and your mom here in Fort Wayne talking with our group here. And the last time I was with you at WEM, and Zugby, you can address this maybe, uh, you had just received word from the Vatican that they were going to assist you or you were reaching out to them, their representative. And so you've really, I mean, as sad as it all is, you've received uh, uh, assistance and support from all around the world, have you not? I believe a lot of people were praying and uh, having uh, thoughts about how to enhance our steadfastness. I, I believe uh, it was outcry because my brother uh, Lucas was going to get married and my wife was outside. So uh, I believe the Vatican um, ambassador in Jerusalem interfered on our behalf uh, we tried to reach the American consulate, American uh, government um, through my wife. Uh, it was very difficult to have any progress. And uh, thanks at the end, they agreed to let her in. But of course, uh, there are conditions not to let her drive, not to go to Jerusalem, not able to work. And on top of that, they took 70,000 shekels up till yeah. down. They didn't return it uh, as a guarantee that she will leave when the visa is stopped. So we, after that, she went to the States, we applied, and of course takes time to respond from the Israeli government to her visa, uh, uh, you know, appeal. Um, now, I thank heavens, 24th of seven, the visa will expire. Hopefully it will be renewed and again, um, we need your prayers and thoughts to continue with us. You know, um, um, Elaine's uh, pastor here in, in the South Bend, Ken Raymond, who also came and was present for the wedding, I think for Lucas's wedding, is on the call today. So I'm sure he sends his greetings uh, as well. You know, uh, here in the States, uh, there is... Uh, a real uproar among us who are activists here. I mean, I could go down the list, right? Sheikh Jarrah, Silwan, uh, uh, Gaza, Al-Aqsa, uh, and, and all the many, you know, Bilin with the Bernat family, Daoud Nasser and his trees that were just set fire to. I mean, one, one thing after another are just overwhelming us here in the activist community. Um, talk to us about not just those things that are happening, but the resistance movements, the resistance movements that are happening throughout Palestine. And I know that's a big question, but uh, uh, these are big issues. And each one, of, each one by themselves is important, but the cumulative effect, right, is just overwhelming us here. You know, they say, as George Bernard Shaw, if it is to me, it's up to me. For us, we are, very committed for the nonviolent popular struggle. And uh, what happened to us in the last uh, 15 days and mainly the 12 days attack on Gaza was a war crimes. And, uh, you know, this reminds me with Norman Finkelstein, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, article about modalities of conquest. And he said, conquest comprises four elements, extermination, expulsion, encirclement, and conquest. I can repeat them. These uh, conquests comprises four elements, extermination, expulsion, encirclement, and conquest. And these four elements are here and are practiced by the occupation by the state of Israel at this moment. And actually it is really a big uh, crime to see at least 17,000 housing units have been destroyed in Gaza. 
100,000 persons became refugees, no place to live. They live in schools. And many of the schools were destroyed, you know, whole family, whole family, father, mother, and kids also were killed. And, uh, you know, people couldn't even have water. 50% of the water network in Gaza is hampered, uh, no electricity. And on top of that, they destroy, the, the power to be destroyed, 23 media institutions. They didn't want the world to see what is going on. Yeah. Um, we don't want to talk about numbers, how many killed, because the issue is not numbers. The issue is lives. Families were destroyed. And, uh, you know, there were 66 children killed in this uh, attack and 39 women and 17 elderly men and more than 1948 wounded. So there is no family in Gaza was not uh, touched. The same in the West Bank as a result of the uh, movement and the struggle. This is the first time in history that Palestinians in the upper Galilee, in the Triangle, in Jerusalem, in West Bank and, and Hebron had a strike on, on Tuesday. So there was a kind of unity at that time and uh, but and then they, they, there was a ceasefire and actually what kind of ceasefire still there are imprisonment every day we hear more young people are imprisoned Sheikh Jarrah also now besieged there are blocks to prevent the people to go in and out from Sheikh Jarrah there are imprisonment inside Israel more and more. There are at least, for example, 170 uh, prisoner in the last three days. And uh, since the beginning of May, more than 2,400 Palestinians were in prison in the West Bank. So we are living in a situation that trauma and fear and there is anxiety of this possession and trauma of this possession. You know, all of us are now hostages to trauma and to fear. We don't know what will be happening next. There is ethnic cleansing, whether we like it or not. But at the same time, um, we continue to live. We haven't closed our office and uh, we continue to work deliberately to be with the people in psychosocial counseling and assisting families and keeping our staff sane and also safe. I stop here opening the floor for also my colleagues to respond. Uh, we're really, thank you very, very much for that uh, summary, Zubi. That was, that was very helpful for the, the lay of the land. Uh, Tarek and Osama, uh, let me, I want you to talk about resistance movements, but but let me uh, let, let me just ask one more thing about the resistance. One of the things that we're we continue to hear about the the uprising and resistance movements throughout the West Bank is that it's being led this time by the youth of Palestine. By, by, by young people that at least it, many young people have, have, have leadership roles. And one of the reasons for that is because there's a real frustration with Palest uh, Palestinian government officials to push back hard enough against the ethnic cleansing by Israel. So can, can you include that in your answer that young people throughout Palestine have been energized and are taking the lead in the resistance? And maybe Osama and Tarek, both of you address that? Sure, uh, maybe if it's okay with Osama, I'll start. Okay. Um, and yes, so there's frustrations, but it's not only because of the Palestinian government and its inability to actually guarantee or realize a sort of sovereignty. It's also frustration with the situation as a whole. If we look at the history, you know, this is now at least the 70th plus year of Palestinians living under occupation. Ongoing. 
Yes, and from the beginning of the conflict, we already had these movements, both nonviolent and popular resistance, but we've seen that these movements haven't been able to realize any positive change for the Palestinians on the ground, at least. And so there was a common idea before that we cannot live under occupation, but at least fighting for the Palestinian cause or for justice gave us something to live or die for. But now as we see the US and Israeli industrial military complex grow even stronger, as we see the ties, you know, we just finished the presidency with Mr. Trump, who basically offered Israel anything they wanted without any repercussion. And then we moved on to Biden, hoping for change. But then we saw even within the first days of the wars when the children were a main um, casualty, the Biden administration stayed silent. And so it's frustration with the government, but it's also frustration with the lack of change. And so it's the new blood, it's the younger generation that haven't been there long enough and struggled, especially with popular and nonviolent resistance. And they are, haven't been able to lose their hope yet. And so of course, the other thing is this is the COVID pandemic. And as you know, Bethlehem relies heavily on its tourism sector. And so during this time, we're talking about rampant unemployment of over 80% of the population in Bethlehem. One of the reasons our community still thrives is because of the community-based culture in which families support each other, but even within the community, the community supports itself. Those who have support those who do not have. But so because of this rampant unemployment, you know, if you don't have an income, it may be more difficult to go out to restaurants, to buy clothes for the celebrations of Eid, for Christmas, for Easter. And so resistance is one of the few things that may not cost anything other than one's life or one's potential freedom. It's not a monetary cost. And so it's a cost that most people can still afford in a sense, monetarily. Thank you, Tarek. Osama? Um, you, know, you know, like uh, youth are the majority and youth having the power. Uh, in the recent uh, demonstration against uh, the occupation and against what uh, happening and against the mis uh, the continuing of mistreatment of the Palestinian, we have seen all generation. Uh, yeah, the youth have have been taking more lead and invitation, inviting uh, because they they know how to deal more with social media and networking and 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 uh, WhatsApp groups and all of these things. Uh, but uh, we have seen all generation, yeah, um, from kids uh, to youth to 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 to, uh, to act to activist, uh, activists from different uh, generation. Uh, what has been happening and continue is, is 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 violation for the human rights of the Palestinian, violation of the international humanitarian law, and violation of um, so youth. You know, like young people who has been, uh, you know, like born with such situation, raised up and seeing this wall and settlements and checkpoints, and 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 they are more open with networks and social media. They they realize that this is not normal, and uh, it has been ongoing. So they feel that they can do something, and they they want to do something to end it. You know. So they have been, uh, you know, like participating and leading and, um, you know, like through their networks and uh, to call for participation. And, uh, you know, we hope that there will be more, uh, you know, like kind of international awareness. We have seen a huge movement in, in, many, uh, in, in many countries around the world and we have seen a huge demonstration and, uh, uh, and we hope that this will continue to be able to make pressure uh, on, on the leaders of the countries to, to, to like make pressure to stop Israel from continue uh, the, the, the occupation power uh, and put an end uh, because peace is possible. So, you know, it's also talking about inside Israel. You are talking about 2 million Palestinians living in Israel uh, for almost 73 years, and they see racism, and they see that they are considered third or fourth or fifth class citizen, 
and many of the youth who have been living there see that they have no future under this kind of uh, a Jewish uh, state as they, you know, have a law for the Jewish national identity. So, and, uh, and for example, Ramla, Lidda, Jaffa, people who live in their homes, they are not allowed to fix the windows or the bathroom or the living room. So uh, all of this pressure, the long simmering frustration with the biased racist policy push the young people inside Israel to go onto the streets. And I'm afraid that now a day is they will pay a heavy price because of their uh, approach and their resistance. So many will say, if Israel is not giving equal citizenship to those who have been living with them and who are, is the, who are the original, uh, the aboriginal, the natives of this land, how come they will uh, have peace and justice with us? I have a number of questions uh, on my list. I know a number of the folks who are tuning in have questions as well. Let me get to a couple of them, okay? Uh, and again, like I say, we have plenty of uh, interest and questions. We we all we all know here um, the ethnic cleansing, the apartheid, the settler colonial project that is Zionism. So we we get we get that I think. But there's, I guess, and maybe it's uncomfortable, and maybe you don't want to say much. But I guess what I was trying to get at is the increasing frustration with the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian leadership, and it, it, and one of the questions asked that that's that's something that is more within Palestinian control. And so, what are some of your thoughts on that? How can how, how is that being addressed internally? Within, uh, within the West Bank. And again, I, I know that maybe that's more uncomfortable to talk about, but if you could share at least a few thoughts about that. Yes, so there is no problem. I believe the Palestinian youth and the Palestinian population, you know, are not happy with the outcome of the peace process, with the outcome of uh, the signing of peace process since 1993. Yeah. I give you an example, 100,000 settlers was in 1993, and now we have 800,000 settlers. So, and they feel that the Palestinian Authority and the other factions are not doing anything to stop this kind of unilateral uh, violation of human rights. So uh, a lot of rebelliousness is happening against everyone. Uh, and uh, to be frank with you, I think what we need reform, we need uh, elections, we need to sort out ways how to build our own institutions. But I tell you also the matrix of control of the yeah. state of Israel is beyond any kind of positivity. Yes, we are thinking of new leadership, we think of uh, a new approach, you know, but at the same time, our line or my line I feel any bad national government is better than colonial government. This is what Gandhi taught me. Any bad national government is better than colonial government. And the issue is this, the state of Israel deal with us as pattern client. And this create unhealthy relationship with our uh, authority. Yes, but at the same time, I think there is a room for reform. There is a room for uh, creativity. I, I feel the obstacle, again, will continue to be the Israeli occupation, but also we have our own duties to be liberated and to have the state of law, to have democracy, to have the court system, to have things. At the same time, I don't know how any authority could function on less than 30% uh, uh, of West Bank, you know? And the 70% is in Area C. What happened, for example, for the uh, Tent of Nation? Uh, the area is in Area C, okay? And if the Palestinian will uh, imprison those people, if they have good relationship with Israel, the Israeli authorities will uh, threaten to come and take. So it is, we are besieged by 
bad governance, by occupation, by uh, uh, Uncle Sam, who support Israel uh, without any conditions, $375 million is supported by Biden government to That's Israel. Right. At this moment, where I believe it is our time to ask whether we are Americans or not, my family, uh, five, six, uh, five of them are Americans. Where does the tax money go? Why should go to settlements and enslaving us? And I will tell you also, nowadays the danger is not only from the occupation, is from the settlers' violence. And we see how the settlers' violence on all the West Bank. I think what is needed now, a new approach. We hope that there will be presidential elections. There will be Palestinian legislative election. There will, we hope that there will be at least council elections for the cities and the villages. But at this moment, it is very risky. We are not sure where are we heading, whether there, this ceasefire will lead to uh, a peace treaty, a new one, or whether uh, this will continue to procrastination and luring us and uh, Israel will continue its uh, creeping annexation and creeping building settlements and denying our rights. I'll stop here. Thank you, Zubi. I want to just follow up. Uh, you, you raised a number of issues, uh, uh, a couple of which uh, are picked up in a question from your mutual, our mutual good friend who's on, uh, Don Wagner. Uh, he wants to just send his solidarity greetings to all of you. But he asks if, if there's a call for international protection for Palestinians. He, and I'll just quote, it's not the first priority. And it's a complicated issue, but what, what do you three think? Given the extremist settler attacks and police protection of settlers, the Palestinians have no protection. So is there an international call, uh, a call for international protection for Palestinians? And from whom would that come? Uh, uh, so anyway, I'll leave that at that. And Don, thank you for your question. Tariq Osama. Uh, you know, recently we have seen uh, many activ activism and many campaigns and, and, and many campaigns that circulated to collect signs, whether for, uh, you know, uh, making pressure uh, and uh, like uh, 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 collecting some signs that occupation must be punished for uh, its crimes and uh, there must be accountability like what happened yesterday in uh, Ramallah. You know, the undercover the Israeli soldiers came into Ramallah uh, to arrest someone, according to them, their story, and they have shoot and kill a young man, 23 years old. And in the end of the day, they say we are, you know, like they call his parents and say, we are sorry, you know, like he wasn't our target. So uh, we killed him by mistake. So if, if these soldiers will not be punished for killing a, an innocent a civilian people, you know, it's going to continue. Uh, last week, we have seen uh, the video of the Israeli soldiers shooting uh, a, a girl in her home in uh, Sheikh Jarrah while she was preparing the coffee. That's and she right. was yeah. back and she can't walk anymore. Uh, today, one of my friends from Beth Hanina, she was telling me that her, uh, like a settler, pulled a gun, um, you know, like at her daughter while she was taking the light train in Jerusalem. So, like, there is, it's, it's ongoing, you know, like, uh, everyone is scared, the, the violence from the settlers, the violence from the police, the way that the police are treating the Palestinians, uh, uh, damaging their cars uh, uh, with no respect. So without uh, accountability, uh, you know, like this will not end. And, and they are going to continue uh, with uh, all these atrocities. We so, believe we need international protection we need international presence, that this presence should have teeth and should really act accordingly to your resolutions and also to protect the people and especially in Jerusalem, to keep the status quo of the holy places. I am afraid if there will be no involvement from the international community and this different states in the world we will go into religious wars. And I see what happened in Al-Aqsa, you know, 
uh, and also the churches. When our people try to go to the celebrations of the Holy Sepulchre on Easter, the yeah. Israeli even tried to prevent the Christians to go to church on that day and they imprison kids and youth. So international protection is needed accordingly with the Fort Geneva Convention, with the international human rights and international law. Otherwise, if we go into religious wars, either you win a seat in heaven or conquer the enemy. For <laughs> us, we don't want to uh, have a seat in heaven. We want to live and celebrate life. But also I'll let you know that the first uprising in 1980, modern, first uh, modern uprising in 1987, it was popular struggle, nonviolent. Right. 2001, it was a mixture of armed struggle and popular struggle. Now it was a different war. So I, what will be the next? Will be a religious uh, decade of wars? I don't know. I leave the floor for uh, Tarek and Osama. If I may add one thing to this. Well, let let yeah. me just add this, Tarek, and then you can fold this into your answer maybe. I was just on the phone with Jeff Halper on Monday evening, and he, he said almost word for word what your dad just said, what Zugby just said. And that is that he is always in his talks, and you know me here, and all the talks I've given, I've been, I've been very real, I've been very clear that the, this isn't a religious conflict. It's not a religious war. It's a political struggle. It had, you know, how, how you parse it, you know, and, and you make the distinctions. Jeff said, though, just like what your dad said, the increase, the, the, the increasing violations of Christians being allowed to get to their holy places and the violation this time of Al-Aqsa. That now he's seeing more and more in, in, in the protests and that religious signs of a, a religious, a religious struggle. And he said that changes, that changes the game. Mm -hmm. And so he and your dad are, I think are on the same page here. And he says, it's more dangerous than ever because if it becomes a religious struggle, all bets are off, is how he put it. Anyway, Tark, please. Yeah, well, it's not just that. It's also, you know, this is what the U.S. is paying for, right? When we're talking about Christian Zionism, they're waiting for this religious war. They're waiting for the annihilation of all non-Christians. And yeah. so this is also something that is being perpetuated consciously and intentionally because I think with the rampant xenophobia and Islamophobia, especially in the US, if we do talk about the attack on Al-Aqsa, that of course is gonna cause greater support from Muslim communities around the world. And from the lens of that xenophobia and Islamophobia, that may be threatening to the US and to Israel, which would then simply allow the US to double down on its support for Israel and allow for even greater genocide against the Palestinians, both Christian and Muslim. But um, in regards to the previous question of international support, we have been asking and calling for it, but we've also been prioritizing and calling for an end of complicity, especially Western complicity. I mean, it is clear to every Palestinian and if we simply look at the financial statements one of the reasons this occupation has been able to continue is because the U.S. isn't simply giving its blind support to Israel, it's also giving its financial support to Israel. And this is also allowing Israel to fight more effectively. With the current demonstrations, and one of the things that Israel is very good at is collective punishment. And so every time we have a panel like this and we're invited to speak on these issues, one of the questions we ask ourselves, how will this hurt my mom? How will this hurt my mom's ability to stay? And that's something simple. My mom has more protection as an American citizen, but then when you look at Palestinian families, how does resistance affect them? And in many cases, someone's accused of something and now their family home, their cousin's home, their brothers and sisters home are now all destroyed. Yeah. So Israel is very good at using an iron hammer to also not simply keep and uphold the status quo, but make sure that there are less Palestinian voices 
resisting, and that if the voices are resisting, that they face real repercussions. But so with that, part of this is the U.S. support and the financial support has allowed Israel to grow its industrial military complex. When we're talking about the war on Yemen, when we're talking about what's happening in Philippines, when we're talking about what's happening in Sudan, especially South Sudan, these are all countries that have armed deals with Israel, even though some of these countries have been on lists of embargoes or there's been calls to end these arm deals with them, we still see that Israel is able to continue and establish and continue strengthening these ties and growing its profit. And then, of course, causing this need for a war, for a genocide on Gaza so that they can test these weapons, so that they are battle proven, so then they can fund future occupation settler colonial apartheid. I want to I want to ask thank you for that all of you uh, Palestinians stand united in their struggle for freedom Muslim and Christian you yourselves are practicing prayerful uh, Christians your colleague Lucy Telgia is a member of Kairos Palestine uh, which in the last year issued their cry for hope addressed to Christians globally not just church denominations, but Christians around the world. Um, and it asks for decisive action. The subtitle is, We Cannot Serve God and the Oppression of Palestinians. Say a word about Kairos Palestine and the cry for hope of Palestinians to Christians and people of goodwill, really, around the world. Yeah. It is, there are many calls from churches, from church groups like Kairos to cry for hope. And we want the world to exert pressure on Israel to say enough is enough. It is an appeal that through nonviolent uh, struggle to tell the world, come and rescue the situation before it is too late. And for us, let me, care. I can address this issue more about hope because hope for us is a form of nonviolent struggle. And we want to keep hope for the people. If we lose hope, it is disaster. So not only churches, but also other civil society organization calling for hope. And, and I think this is the time that the world should respond but I am afraid that the world is looking at some of the conflict, despite we have popular support and a lot of movement against the occupation and this hope is translated, you know, when we see people, uh, the church is now, to be frank with you, uh, a little bit silent in the West. So it seems they yeah, haven't yeah. heard diplomatic so you're being very uh, diplomatic. They, I don't I, I, I think they haven't heard our cry you know yeah. I wish they learn what happened against the South African apartheid regime when they were very active in ending this apartheid why the churches are not uh, loud why not the churches are not involved yes uh, they were accused of being anti-semitic or that the, the conflict is with religious extremist group as Hamas. No, the issue is if we, we need the Palestinian to go on the line of democracy and diversity and pluralism, churches and faith-based organization should voice, should voice whether friends of Sabil in America, friends of Sabil in Canada and everywhere, Kairos, uh, Catholic Church, the Vatican, the Evangelical, CMAP, Churches for Middle East Peace. I feel we need to find ways how to channel our anger and say clearly occupation is evil and we need to end the occupation, my brother. Otherwise, you know, the uh, people here, there will be no Christians besides the just cause of the Palestinian. Christians will disappear and churches will be museums. We want the churches and the people to continue because it is the only guarantee 
uh, guarantor for uh, diversity and unity. Thank you, Zubri. I'd like to have, uh, I'd like to ask Osama and Tarek to address uh, a subject that many of us are, are asked, many of us who are activists are asked to address every time there's a flare up, there's, there's uh, the peace broken, every time there's uh, 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 an incursion in the Gaza, every time there, uh, it makes the news in the United States, right? Uh, uh, the conflict, the, 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 the war that takes place is always framed as Israel versus, quote, the Hamas terrorists. And so we're always asked to somehow address Hamas. And there's a couple of questions in the chat room. Uh, one of them is about if there's elections today, would Hamas win and win overwhelmingly? And secondly, just uh, uh, what advice would you give the folks, some of whom have been involved in this struggle here in the US for decades and others who've just begun having to answer their friends, how would you have them talk about uh, Hamas when their friends ask them? Uh, you know, uh... I, I might add something. And uh, you know, like uh, the Palestinian Israeli issue didn't start uh, recent, has been, uh, you know, since the end of the 19th uh, century. And if when we talk about Hamas, Hamas is a new movement that was started in uh, 1987. So the, 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 the conflict is not between Israel and, and Hamas. There is an occupation that violates the human rights. And whenever there is occupation, there will be a resistance uh, for the occupation. I'm not a supporter of Hamas, and I will never uh, will be, you know. Uh, but uh, in the end, you know, like uh, the, the last war and any war, it wasn't a war between Israel and Hamas. It's, it's, it's between Israel and the Palestinian resistance, uh, Israel and everyone who's against the occupation. And what we hope that uh, we are not, going to beg our rights or uh, we are not going to, uh, uh, you know, like we want to see an international movement that make pressure, especially on the uh, Security Council to put an end for, for all this injustice. That's its ongoing. And uh, especially countries with power to stop their support or maybe make conditions because uh, these countries that mainly support uh, with uh, military aid that they can make a condition, you know, to stop what is going on and the violation of the human rights. Uh, so I don't see it. Uh, that I don't see the conflict as a conflict between Israel and Hamas. Hamas has been, uh, you know, uh, participating in the resistance. Hamas is now controlling Gaza, and Gaza has been, you know, sieged for many years. People in Gaza are uh, still willing to have life and hope and. Uh, despite all the challenges and all the wars that they have faced. I have seen, uh, you know, some photos today from young people and elderly and children cleaning, clear, clearing, uh, cleaning the streets of Gaza after all this damage. And uh, so uh, we as Palestinians are re re refused to lose hope and we are continue to protect our humanity. The situation is complicated. Um, you know, uh, and the occupation is continue with their project to, you know, fight. it's a colonial project. They want more land and more, uh, more, uh, uh, more land and more control. Thank you, Sam. Sorry. To add to that, um, of course, Hamas was partially trained and created and funded with the support of Israel to try and divide the Palestinian unity and weaken it. But it's also important that the creation of Hamas added religious sentiment to the struggle. And that is to help the international world see it as Israel wants it to be seen as a religious struggle, because yeah. then it becomes much more complicated. But I think one of the important things to say is of course, under international law, any occupied people have the right to resist by any means necessary. But as many of us here are pro nonviolent advocacy, how do we address this? And I think one of the important things is to ask why does Hamas commit 
to this violence. You know, one of the interesting things is if we're talking about this year, Hamas rockets firing into Israel was during that period of two weeks. What about the rest of the year? I mean, they had the rockets, right? They didn't just come overnight. And one of the important things to understanding is one of the reasons Hamas continues to gain popularity is because people have lost hope in an international peace or just negotiation system, accords, whatever we want to call it. And while we can't continue to live under occupation, for many people in Gaza, Hamas gives them something to die for if they can't live. And they can't live with the current circumstances that they have. But the other part of this is if Hamas is not targeting Israel year round, then they're targeting during specific moments, then the simple way to do away with Hamas or to do away with that extremism or violence, whatever it wants to be called or labeled in the West is to look at the root causes that is causing Hamas to act in this way, which is the continued occupation. And so the most effective way to ending any violence against Israel and to ending any Palestinian quote unquote violence is through working towards a just solution that gives Palestinians their dignity, gives them their rights, affords them opportunity, and most importantly, gives them sovereignty, gives them the ability to control their borders. Um, in the previous question about the Palestinian Authority, we use the word authority very ironically. And you know, it's a Swiss cheese. How can someone have a authority over people when they can't access those people every day and when they want to? Thank you for that, uh, guys. Uh, <clears throat> I have five questions and we've got 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, I just wanna give you a, a lay of the land here. The first one comes from uh, our mutual friend, Michael Pogue. Um, what would protection from the international community look like, UN peacekeepers or something else? Um, there's another question and uh, um, you all uh, have uh, Indiana roots. So from uh, one of our board members, uh, Linda Kerr, who was just with us, uh, uh, with you there a couple years ago. Our governor, our Indiana governor, uh, Governor Holcomb, is in Israel right now in solidarity with the government of Israel. What message shall we deliver to this man when he returns uh, home? Uh, what message should be central, central in our protestations and demonstrations? I believe, uh, for example, on the personal level, let him that uh, there is a Hoosier girl whose rights are violated. They are not allowing her to be with her family and with her kids to live in peace and security. Second, you know, uh, you know, we are not asking people to be pro-Palestinian. We want people to be pro-justice, that he needs to meet, I wish that, in his schedule to meet with the Palestinians in Bethlehem, in Ramallah, in Jerusalem, to see, to meet with the Christians and Muslims, to see what they are, what is happening to them. I, I feel he needs to know the stories of many of the families who suffer under the Israeli occupation. It's just stories, human stories, and uh, this is what I, I think. Uh, he needs to change the lenses, you know, and I hope the uh, Indiana people, as well as Americans, will try to uh, give him a 101 course in history. Thank you, Zabi. Osama, uh, I want to get you, I want to get you as part of the conversation here. You, uh, in the last number of years, you have been ubiquitous uh, in leading many groups throughout the West Bank, whether they're hikes uh, to Batir and other ecological uh, 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 world heritage sites. Um, you've taken my groups and many, many groups for Joan Deming, who's on the call uh, and, and other groups. Tourism, as you pointed out earlier, has been decimated in Bethlehem and throughout the West Bank. Uh, hurting the economy, and many of us are eager, eager to return 
not only to see the sites, but to show solidarity with you and the rest of our friends. And there's Elaine in the background. Hello, Elaine. Hello, Hi. Elaine. Good to see you. Good to see you too. I say something. Good blessings to you. Yes, and and uh, then a person who would love to meet with the governor. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you. I bet you. Uh, yeah, her ears were burning. Uh, Osama, tell us a little bit about what you're hearing about uh, travel for tourists and internationals. We keep hearing June 1st, it might start opening up slowly, but what are you hearing? You know, the, the last announcement uh, by the Israeli Minister of Tourism, you know, as, as earlier Tariq mentioned that our borders is not in our hand and, you know, our authority is without authority. So no control uh, for borders or anything else. So Israeli Minister of Tourism announced that uh, uh, until the end of uh, May, there will be around 40 groups allowed, uh, 44 groups allowed to come as a test and see how things will go. And after 1st of June, uh, there will be a new announcement. Uh, and we don't know yet whether these groups will be allowed uh, into the West Bank or only um, you know, uh, in, in uh, Israel and Jerusalem. So things are not yet clear. Uh, but we hope to see tourism back into Bethlehem because that's the normal situation. Uh, tourism, uh, Bethlehem without tourism is, is, a, is a dead city. So, uh, you know, Bethlehem is a tourist-related uh, city, so all these businesses have been dying, you know, hotels, restaurants, uh, souvenir shops, uh, handicraft uh, workshops. So it's a very important, and tourism is very important because, uh, you know, like uh, we, we, we feel that we have not been forgotten by our brothers and sisters. You know, they come and see us and visit us and hear our stories and they, they see things by, by their eyes, you know. They see the occupation firsthand, they see the checkpoints, they see the, the violation of human rights, they see the settlements, uh, they see this ugly wall, you know. Uh, so it, it's very important. To, to, to welcome again all these groups and visitors and pilgrims, you know, uh, because even if they are coming just for religion purpose, uh, and when they see things, they will ask questions. And when they ask questions, they are going to learn. Uh, and that's how many internationals were learning about the injustice and the occupation, uh, even if they are not uh, coming to see that, and that's not their interest. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Earlier in answer to the question, Osama said something that was very profound, I thought. Uh, he said that you've been living in the last 15 months under a double occupation, COVID uh, in the last 15 months, but you've been living under this occupation, right, for 73 years, uh, and even more than occupation, right, ethnic cleansing and apartheid. One of you only have to visit WeM once, and I've been there many times, of course, but you only have to meet you once to know uh, that the strongest thing about WeM is that wherever you find a need in the community, you step up to meet that need. Even if it wasn't part of why you started in the first place, you meet the needs of the people on the ground, men, women, youth, children, seniors, people of all ages and needs. Tell us about your work in the last uh, 15 months and how you've met this double occupation. Um, you know, we haven't closed our office at all since the beginning of the pandemic. We are always open and our homes become our offices. And uh, we, uh, you know, uh, use different methods, psychosocial counseling, um, helping many needy families, whether through food uh, baskets or hygiene kits or medicine. And also we include job creation to let people earn their money in dignity. And uh, so this is, we continue and also mediating conflicts because it is a good season of conflict. There are a lot of displaced anger. The violence was very uh, increasing in our community. And of course, it is the repercussion of the choking 
policy of the occupation as well as a uh, few people who are led astray. So we, and also prayer, vigils, uh, uh, solidarity with the people, being with them anytime. And we are on call 24 hours. This is what we continue today. We have received a lot of families to ask for help because March 5th, up till this moment, uh, many of those who work in tourism and pilgrimage have nothing to do or save or to spend. Thank you, Zabi. I, I, I know that um, your work is critically important uh, not only in Bethlehem, but the, the Christian Triangle, in fact, in all the South, even in, even in the villages. And I know that you've extended support as far as Gaza and other, other towns in the West Bank. But you're, it's the respect with which you're held and your grassroots efforts 24-7 that, that you make such a difference in, in your community. So I'm glad that you uh, didn't, uh, didn't have to close your doors. And that doesn't surprise me just knowing you the way I do. Azubi, um, how could we support you? Um, you know, I think what you are doing is a great help. Exposing what is happening in the area is very important. And the struggle, for example, why not to start a campaign you know, for uh, asking the world for international protection, international conference for the Palestinians. Maybe the Indiana Center will start with other organization, Friends of Sabil, CMAP, and so on, to start a campaign to say we need to uh, convene international conference. We need to send you and uh, keeping uh, peacekeeping and so on bringing groups to us, you know, and to, you know, have our people, you know, to be um, guides, to be, uh, you know, to schedule, to uh, have itineraries from A to Z to visit all the historic land and to, as always we say, not only to visit the holy stones, but to meet the living stones and to be introduced uh, to the rolling stones. I'm going to let Zugbi and Tarek and Osama have the last word, but before I do, I just want to remind you that today's program with our guests, as well as all our interviews, are available on our NES Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel. Uh, we hope you'll share news of our interviews uh, with your friends. So Zugbi and Osama and Tarek, Man, is it ever good to see you three. Uh, please give our love, uh, Tarek, to your siblings, Osama to your family, Zugbi to Elaine. Would you want to share any parting words for us? I Probably I will conclude with what Desmond Tutu says. He is one of my heroes. He says, let no one tell you we don't need a revolution. Let no one tell you we don't need a revolution. The old ways do not work. And this is very important. The old ways do not work. We need a Holy Spirit birth revolution, a revolution of goodness, a revolution of compassion, a revolution of love. And please pray for this kind of revolution to emerge that will unify all of us in a spiritual movement, whether we are Christians, Muslims, and Jews, ending the occupation, uh, strengthening justice, and moving to a better uh, way in this less traveled road. Zugbi, thank you, uh, my brother, uh, for sharing that. Osama, and then Tarek. You know, I just want to thank everyone who works for real uh, justice and peace locally and internationally and will, you know, always uh, continue to, uh, to, to do our best to uh, commit with uh, what we believe and what we work for 
uh, you know, to keep love and, and hope and, uh, uh, you know, like uh, despite all the challenges to protect our humanity. So I want to thank you again uh, for this uh, work and God bless everyone who works for real uh, justice and peace. Again, thank you for all of your solidarity and for your commitment to justice. I think um, the thought I'd like to leave you with is that this is not a zero sum game. It's a zero sum game in its current state. But what we are fighting for is Palestinian rights, not at the expense of Israeli rights. We are fighting for an inclusive future altogether. And so the last thing I would like to say is for the governor of Indiana, for the presidents of the world, but especially of the US, I think we need to call upon them to prioritize people, to prior prioritize the people in their countries, but also to prioritize people around the world instead of profits or relationships. And together we can build a more inclusive future that celebrates the diversity in its entirety. The three of you, uh, you always tell us that we bring you hope by, by meeting with you and by coming to visit you. But I, I wanna speak for everyone on here on the call that you bring us hope, not only uh, in our work in support of Palestinian rights and your work at WEM, but in our own work for justice here in the US and around the world. And you remind us that in the end, it, it's, it's love that matters, it's hope that matters, it's faith that matters. And so we thank you for inspiring us, challenging us, and uh, standing in solidarity with each other. So once again, Osama, it's good to see you, man. Tarek, uh, it's good to see you. Blessings to you and to your sister and other brothers. Zugby, give Elaine a hug, a collective hug from all of us. Know that we are sending our love to you and to her as you will be facing challenges and to all the people of Bethlehem and throughout Palestine. God bless you all and thank you all for joining us today.